FM Studios brought to you by Old Mutual. Yeah, welcome to a masterclass on how I did it. Uh, I think ultimately that's what this masterclass is about. The journey I walked, lessons I learned along the way, methods I used on me that you can apply on yourself. So there's two truths first. The first truth is I'm used to a crowd in front of me. So right now I only have crew. Uh, what's up, crew? <laughs> Uh, so it's weird, I'm gonna literally be talking uh, straight into camera. Now, the second truth is that I actually don't like public speaking. Believe it or not, I'm a very shy guy. Yes, I love radio, I love DJing, but I don't appreciate the attention I get from everything that I do. But I have to navigate the attention because I need to do what I love in the hope that it will change someone else's life which is why I choose to speak right now. One of the reasons I'm the shy guy I say I, I am is because I was bullied a lot as a kid. You know, you're a short, fat little kid with a big head. A big kid who got the name Fresh because he was told he looked fresh like meat. Not much has changed, right? He just grew a little. So what did I do about it? I decided that I was gonna flip the script. I literally developed a razor tongue and a sharp mind because I figured from an early age that bullies only thrive because you sit and you take it. I mean, I remember when I was in primary school, there was a farmer from the Northwest. Uh, he donated grass for our football pitch at our school. And our grade five teacher, Mrs. Ashworth, said we must write letters thanking this farmer. And so we got writing. Uh, remember, we're in grade five. And my letter started with, hi, my name is Tato. I'm a young, handsome 10-year-old. Note, I already thought I was handsome at 10, despite the fact that you might have differed uh, in your thoughts. And I remember Mrs. Ashworth in front of the class saying, there's nothing handsome about you. You're just a fat little kid with a swollen head. I've never forgotten that. But I do remember, though, saying the only difference between me and you is that I'm black and you are white. Because she was also short and fat and quite <laughs> rotund, if I will. So I got in trouble for it, but it felt good. And I think it's important to never let anyone determine how you feel about yourself or your self-esteem. I worked out how to get the last word. And that's, that was always my thing. So whether I retorted to your face or in my mind, because you're my mother and I can't say it to your face, I always got in the last word. In fact, I'd like to think it prepared me for radio and for thinking on my feet, which you have to do when you're live on the radio. That's the one thing I appreciate about being bullied. I developed the silver lining belief from that. By the time I was 11, having embraced that nickname. Even my school teachers were calling me fresh. So in a way, bullying prepared me for the entertainment industry. And everyone takes shots at you in entertainment. Everyone has an opinion about your career. You can't even post a demo on Twitter without someone having an opinion about you. There's a lot of hatred, negativity on social media. They can be hard to deal with, but you have to learn to separate people who are being hateful from people who are actually giving you constructive criticism. So I've dealt with people, for instance, that have said not necessarily the most flattering stuff, either about me or my radio show or stuff I've done on TV, but I don't dismiss it. I take everything that's been said and I go through everything that's been said to find out if there's any truth. Listen, be discerning, decide what you can use to be better and what to throw out. But yeah, I'm still a shy guy doing public speaking because I believe uh, part of our constant growth really comes from facing our fears. And facing our fears is how you become the best version of yourself. I wanna share a couple of my fears that I used to fuel the fire. In no particular order, I'm afraid of 
waking up one day and feeling despondent or uninspired. Two, losing my fighting instinct. Three, losing empathy. Four, becoming the person my mom didn't raise. And I think number six, spiders. I am scared of spiders. I can safely say that my fear of spiders is probably not going to go away. But let's take a look at the other ones, since they have less legs for me to contend with. So I knew what I wanted to be by the age of 13. But I face the challenge of many kids today, especially in the black community, where you're told, find something sustainable, more mainstream, more conventional, be a lawyer, be a doctor. In fact, kids today are still being told, you can't pursue the arts or anything out of the ordinary. So what did I do? I listened, as any good child does, and I went to law school. But I wasn't happy. The fear of not becoming, of not at least trying to become what I knew I wanted to be, created a rebellion within me. I've always been motivated by two factors. When people say, you can't do that, I've always taken it as a challenge, not as a decree. I mean, I still remember my family law lecturer saying, it's a big mistake you're making dropping out. You'll amount to nothing. Those words still ring in my head. With everything that I do, I remember my family law lecturer saying, you'll amount to nothing. The second thing, I made sure that if I was going to do what they say I couldn't, that I did it well, because I hate being told I told you so. Because I was raised not to be smug and full of myself, I'd rather let the quality of my work do that for me. My internal rebellion reached a watershed moment of what I'd like to call cutting your nose off because you think you deserve a better one. So I purposefully flunked out of law school. Uh, obviously, the parents were unimpressed, and I don't advocate for flunking as an ideal path to reaching your dreams, but it worked for me because I had a plan, and I knew how I was going to get from A to B. I got an opportunity to study media in uh, Johannesburg, and I knew it was my chance to make it into the industry. I came to Jersey, studied media, journalism, copywriting, got hired as a radio DJ in a couple of months, and the rest is history. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You know, I worked the demo circuit for five years. For five years, working my demos. Every conceivable radio station at the time got my demo. But then opportunity came along. You can call it the universe conspiring. You can call it your guardian angels. Call it God, if you will. Or somebody who cared just opening the door for me. But because I was always ready for every opportunity, I could take action immediately. You just have to stay ready, stay awake, stay sharp. So I'm six months away from my final exams. It's 1997, and one of my classmates says, here's a Soweto newspaper, YFM are holding auditions for a new DJ search. Um, I think 2,000 of us were auditioned, and I saw the ad the day before the final audition. But because I was ready, I literally had all my demo tapes. I had my CV, which I literally updated quickly. And I got to uh, YFM Studios the next day. And after, obviously, the whole process, I got the YFM gig. My attitude has always been, if it's an opportunity, even if it means you fake it until you make it, I'm going to do that. So I ask you, what is your rebellion? What do you stand for? What are you passionate about? Find that rebellious spirit and feed that spirit. Make yourself and your dreams enough of a worthy cause to fight for, because that's what I did. Uh, for me, it was by any means necessary, I want to get to Jersey, and I want to make this dream work. But it can't work unless you're prepared. I'll tell you a story. So Christos was one of the only white DJs doing gigs in the townships in the early 90s. And I remember I was still in Botswana at the time at university. I'd asked my dad for his car, telling him, listen, I'm studying with my friends tonight. And we'd grab our passports drove to the border, crossed it, and drove to Club Gemini in Mabopane, Pretoria. I'd watch Christos perform, and then around 3 a.m., we'd drive back to the border, wait for it to open at 6, drive back home, give my dad his car keys, and say, thanks, we studied well. And the irony is, I did study well. 
Maybe it wasn't the law books he thought it was, but I was studying my hero, Christos, at work. I met another mentor of mine, Oskido, doing a gig in the December of 92. And then he says, my man, I need to wee wee. I'm quoting, please mix the next song for me. In front of what was to me a massive crowd of a thousand people, I said, oh, don't worry about it, Oskido. I've got this. That time, I'm literally peeing myself. So I mixed the first song. How? Oskido is still not back. So I must find another vinyl. Three songs later, he shows up and says, let's play together. And for me, that was the biggest moment in my career. The lesson for me from that has always been, you don't know when that opportunity is going to happen. You need to be prepared all the time. You never know when someone might need to wee-wee, and it could be your time to shine. <laughs> in fact, a lot of people who get radio gigs will tell you that's how they got the radio gig. Someone failed to show up. And whenever I went up to these DJs or anybody else that I looked up to and I introduced myself, um, I made sure I knew my story. I kept it brief. I instinctively knew that after a minute, I could lose that person. So it's important that you're considerate with other people's time, regardless of how much you may feel they might be able to assist you. More often than not, after a minute, you've lost that person, especially when you need their time and they don't need your time. What are you gonna say in that one minute that you have to do an elevator pitch to that person? It's all good hustling to get these gigs, but the work actually starts once you get the gig. The minute you're in, that's actually when the trouble starts. It might be difficult getting in, but it's harder to stay in. And after 28 years in the industry, it doesn't get easier. I'm seeing kids who make it in this industry become arrogant, become complacent. They get caught up in their own hype. It's an unfortunate truth that often to be brave, to change, to be better, we must put ourselves in situations outside of our comfort zones. And that comfort zone is, I've got the gig, I can now get into cruise control. There's no time for cruise control once you've got the gig. I mean, a couple of years ago, we were celebrating Madiba's 100th birthday. And if there's one man who showed us the link between bravery and discomfort, suffering to change our lives for the better, it's him. Even in our darkest moments, when you're faced with a challenge, that seems insurmountable. That's often when you can get the most creative. I can't stress this enough. Don't doubt yourself. Don't doubt your capabilities. We were built to survive. We were built to thrive. And I've never shied away from any challenge because those are the times that I have grown the most. I mean, I remember when I moved from uh, YFM to 5FM. They'd never had a black drive-time DJ in their history. And that alone was pressure that was so daunting. Literally the month before I started at 5FM, every single night, I had nightmares about that move. But in my mind, I said, you know what? I'm gonna do it. And in fact, instead of just doing one drive show, I'm gonna do both drive shows. And that's what I did. Because I was not willing to one, let myself down, but also let down a legion of other kids who look like me that might have thought that that space doesn't belong to me. As long as you're talented enough, as long as you're qualified enough, why the hell not? And my need to change how black kids thought about themselves became bigger than my fear of actually moving to 5FM. Let your bigger purpose lead you even to where your fears are on some, are you sure you want to do this? So I've been talking about learning, 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 but my kids are teaching me more about myself than I could have ever imagined. I've got a five-year-old, and he doesn't understand how much I've learned from him. So Lefika was born premature, so he spent two and a half months in ICU, and because he was born premature, he developed a congenital lung defect where they had to operate and remove half of his one lung. The amazing thing about the human body is that, for instance, the other lung, the good lung, 
then grows to compensate for the space that was created during the operation when half of his other lung was removed. Life will find a way, and when you're faced with a challenge that seems like, I don't know that I can do this, that's often when we need to get going. I don't doubt myself, I don't doubt my capabilities, we were built to survive, we were built to thrive. I've made a lot of bad decisions because I didn't take five. Often someone would come and say, I've got a brilliant idea. And I'd be the first one to say, put me on coach, where do I sign? But one thing I've learned from those mistakes is there's actually no pressure and nothing wrong with saying, listen, I'm gonna sleep on this. There's nothing wrong with saying I will think about it and consulting other people, getting other opinions, reading up more before you sign on the dotted line. Another thing that I'm learning on this journey of mine is that you need to give a damn about other people. I can tell you right now that I have an army that I can call on any time of the day because I've given a damn as I've lived my career. I remember I was at a music conference in Miami a couple of years ago, and there was a well-known DJ there, and I overheard him mentioning in passing that his mother-in-law had cancer and was in hospital. And I remember we were chatting on instant messenger a couple of months later, and I asked him how his mother-in-law was doing. And he was literally close to tears, at least that's what he said to me, because he didn't think anyone was listening enough to want to follow up and ask, how is your mother-in-law doing? It's little things like that that allow you to build an army. There's a lot of pain around us. So often we program ourselves not to see it. But I often say, don't let it become a habit. Taking a moment to start giving a damn is all the difference more often than not in another person's life. People never forget the way you make them feel. It's easy to make people feel invisible. We get caught up in ourselves and we forget to make people feel like they belong. You get to work, there's the security that you don't even greet because it's security, they're doing their job and you know, I need to get to my big office. Everyone is part of a bigger picture. When I get to a gig, I make sure that I greet everyone. I take time to ask their names, how are they doing, from security to the cleaners to the sound guy, because the party experience that the club patrons have that night is the sum total of all of us making an effort. If your staff feel visible, they feel that they matter. If they feel that they matter, they do better. If they do better, business becomes better. If you can apply that in everything that you do, if you can practice being lacquer versus being cuck, you can be the difference in everything that you do. Your empathy and your humility a lot of the time will actually open doors your talent will never even touch. My mother is the one who taught me the value of giving a damn. She did a lot of charity work when we were growing up. So mentoring for me is a big part of my life. Mentoring that I do is part of the charity work that I feel I ought to do. I mean, I've mentored, what, close on a thousand DJs through the course of my career. When you mentor someone who looks up to you, that is younger, that is fresher, that is faster, somewhere down the line, they're probably going to repay that favor. Hence, I've got an army behind me. I, I can't stress this enough. It's so important to find out what drives you, what gives you meaning, what gives you purpose. And my mentoring, my giving back, is what gives my life meaning. I work in an industry where I have a platform to reach a lot of people, to try and inspire them. I mean, I remember I moved to Metro deliberately because I felt I could change more lives there than if I'd gone somewhere else. I wanted to be where I could be of the most benefit to others. And you don't need to be on the radio to change people's lives. Never think you don't matter or are insignificant. We all leave a legacy. How many people are feeding how many more people because you bothered, because you helped, because you gave an opportunity? I always say I'm part of Oskidonomics or the Oskido economy because he gave me an opportunity and I'm one of thousands that Oskido has assisted. The Oskido economy has probably generated easily 
a couple billion dollars. That's just from one person who gave a damn. Now, inspired by that, I see why I need to do the same. So, for instance, my foundation has given, what, 2,000 bursaries to kids to develop their futures in the industry. I've mentored 1,000 young DJs, and I make it my mission to give a little bit of hope, inspiration, random general knowledge every day over the radio. I try to be the best man, the best husband, the best father I can be for my family. And that is my legacy. The big question is, what is yours? Thank you. Not only has the internet somewhat evened the playing field, I think even the pandemic, to a certain extent, has evened the playing field. And it's allowed all of us to almost start from scratch in either building or rebuilding or reconnecting with our online databases. Those that have always realized that because I'm online and people want content and I can provide the content, I think those are the kids that are already uh, streets ahead of those that are not doing that. And I preach this all the time. You need to work the internet. Work the internet to death. I had Steve Harvey on my radio show and I was telling him about a time I was in Atlanta. I think I saw him on four or five TV shows. He was doing breakfast radio in Atlanta, but his show was syndicated across I don't know how many other states. And I remember saying to um, Steve Harvey, aren't you worried about being overexposed? He said, there's seven billion people on this planet. Until all of them know me, I'm not overexposed. And I'd never viewed it like that. Because often, for instance, I'd even turn down interviews because I don't want to be overexposed. There's always someone who doesn't know you. There's always someone who maybe knows you but is not, doesn't really catch what you're all about. It's for that reason, in fact, that as much as the cliche is you're only as good as your last radio show, that's actually the truth. If I'm hearing you for the first time and that's the only time I'm going to hear you or see you or watch you, and you don't impress me the first time, I'm not coming back. So we need to stop taking it for granted that because you have an online presence, everyone knows you, now you must relax, now you must stop making an effort. There's a journalist who spoke about Michael Jordan when they played, when the Bulls played an exhibition match in, I think it was in Paris, in France. He said Michael Jordan believes that there's always someone in the crowd that has never seen him play before. It's for that reason that he'll always play this match like it's the only match that matters in the world. Your career needs to be treated like that. There are people out there who don't know who the hell you are. I mean, there are so many good universities and colleges that offer a decent, um, you know, either media studies or full-on journalism, if that's what you want to do. But if you are able to study and you can afford to study, I always say you're better off, despite how talented you are, you're better off backing your talent with some sort of formal um, information and learning uh, than not. You just need, need to decide what works for your pocket and is the course suited to where you want to go with your career. I'd wanted to be on Metro since I was 15 years old. And then things worked out the way they did or didn't work out the way they did. But I've always been a be ready for the next move kind of guy. So when I moved from 5FM to Metro, I was literally given a day to think about it and then three days to put a radio show together. But all of that was stuff I was ready to do. I always have a plan for the next move. So if I was to lose my job at 947 today, I already have a plan for the next move because I've got ducks in a row at the place I want to go to next. I hope you guys haven't changed your minds. But anyway, so for me, it's always be ready. You, nothing is guaranteed, especially when you're working for the man. Nothing is guaranteed. Learn from people that always have someone on standby in case you leave them. There are people that have dropped out of school, even dropped out of matric to pursue the art or whatever it is they felt they were talented at. But very few people make it work at a level 
that it made sense to have quit your 9 to 5 in the first place. So don't look at, for instance, a Casper and say Casper didn't even get his matric and he's succeeding, therefore I want to drop out of high school. Those people are anomalies. Those people, it's, it's one in 20 million. So don't think because someone else did it, you know, the ground is fertile for you too to drop out. Don't take it for granted how important it is to be financially stable. I mean, the lessons I've learned from, for, from pandemic, for instance, because I've always preached, do you have three months of pay that if you lose your job for three months, you're fine? A lot of us have been without incomes for six months now. So obviously that three months of savings ideas out the window, are you taking your money and putting it into something else? Someone like a Prince KB, he's doing trucking for instance. Um, I mean, are you making enough that it allows you to diversify and make money elsewhere? I think gone are the days of saying, I'm gonna just be a singer and nothing else. So I think, think about it and be sure. There's a lot of good singers who are very hungry. Yes, the, the souls are fulfilled, the souls are full, but you can only eat so much of a full soul. And unfortunately, filled souls don't pay rent or bonds. One thing I've learned along the way is, especially when doing business with friends, you need to reach a point where you ask yourself the question, is this friendship worth sacrificing for money. There are great opportunities, for instance, that I have let go of to do business with a friend because for me that friendship meant so much more than if I was to lose it because of money. So there are friends I will do business with, but there are friends that I won't do business with because I don't want to lose that friendship. The past six months of lockdown, of the pandemic, has probably left a lot of people in the arts feeling very despondent. So I think for me, the biggest wish and hope right now is that things eventually open up so that people can start earning and maybe people can start making different financial decisions. And you know, you hear people, especially on social media, literally having zero empathy for the, for the arts. You see a lot of people saying, but you, you guys are always posting your, 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 your decadent lifestyles on social media, uh, why are you telling us right now that uh, you don't have any income? You know, the reality is the five to 10 people that you might see on social media posting the AMGs and whatever else and the massive mansions, that's less than 1% of the industry. 99.9% .9 of this industry are people you will never even know, whose faces you'll never see. There's crew here. Without what we're doing right now, this crew don't have a job, they don't have an income. And I think people need to realize and learn the fact that the entertainment industry is actually bigger than your five faves who might be flaunting their lifestyles. Yeah. So having said that though, my hope is that we can, obviously we need, we're, we're rebuilding from scratch. I mean, the arts I believe have been decimated by this pandemic. So the fact that we're having to build from scratch means that we're having to maybe re-evaluate our relationships with money. It's bad enough you're getting paid rubbish. It's bad enough you're living from gig to mouth, from gig to mouth. It's difficult for you to save when you're earning just enough to live. So, so, so I wish I had a silver bullet solution or an answer, but we're rebuilding from scratch. Eh? And, I think, and I think the more we can share ideas in terms of Maybe you found a way that works for you to rebuild or to have a relationship with your finances. Then I think let's let's I, th I think we need to all be a part of that solution. My business of being a DJ is structured in terms of Big Dog Productions is the company I set up as a means of managing my multiple incomes. But the way we work is. You can either go to my website, djfresh.dj, and there's a booking form there. You send us the booking form. What's the event? Is it sponsored? Is it indoor? Is it outdoor? And uh, we get back to you with a quote. And if you like the quote, sign the contract, pay the deposit, and then you pay the balance before the event. And one of the reasons we structure it that way is there's nothing worse than having to chase after payment after the fact.
and uh, often uh, people argue about what if I don't show up. Um, I'll tell you right now that I take pride in my business, so I show up. Um, I mean, I've missed flights to Zim and driven to Zim because I show up. You know, I missed a flight, I think I was doing Rage in Durban, and the, the 10 flight I missed, and I drove to Durban. I drove to Balito. I think I played at four or five in the morning, but I show up. So, but yeah, that's how my business is structured. But put everything in, in writing. Paper trail is very important um, because you, tomorrow there's a dispute and there's no paper trail because you agreed over the phone. So we started doing Fresh House Flavor. Now, when you start doing CD releases and you're selling platinum, double platinum, you start getting decent checks. So for three years, whenever we released a new house flavor, I released a new car. Until, again, my mentor, Oskido, I remember there was a time I get to Oskido's house and he's driving a, a Corolla. So I was like, where's the ML? He's like, no, I've decided I'm gonna focus on property. And I suggest you start doing the same. That's when I started realizing that, listen, stop blowing money on cars. You don't live in your car. Um, more often than not, the people who see you in a car and are impressed actually don't give a damn. Uh, so for me, cars have started being functional so that I could rather save money for my kids' education. I can rather pay off a bond if that's what I need to do. Yeah, I think I blew a lot of money on cars unnecessarily, and I regret that. One thing I'm learning is what you put on social media could be the difference between whether or not someone wants to work with you, someone wants to use you as an influencer. About two years ago, so I used to post a lot of comedic content on my Instagram, for instance. And I remember there was a time I posted a video of a guy humping the exhaust of a car. And it got all the likes and people were laughing, blah, 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 whatever it is. And two months later, a financial institution that want to work with me. Do you know that I lost what was probably going to be a six-figure deal, if not a seven-figure deal, based on that one post that they felt wouldn't align with what they stand for and it's offensive and whatever else. So because of that, I'm finding that I have to be more, I have to curate what I've put on social media, thinking beyond just the fact that I might find it funny and 10,000 people might find it funny, but how does it affect how I'm perceived out there? For me personally, I'm being more careful now, but also because what happens on social media stays on social media. Often you think you deleted it, life goes on. If it's on the internet, it's on the internet. It's on the internet forever. So, so I think, yeah, let's, let's be careful with the social media. It's important that you sign your own checks. You need to be hands-on when it comes to your money issues. It doesn't matter how small you're earning or how little you're earning uh, for your initial gigs. If you're able to draw a salary based on whatever expenses you have per month and leave the rest in the company account if you've set up a company, do that. Because often we want to blow every cent as it comes in. So even if you're charging 100 rand for a gig, if you can set aside 25 rand and put it in savings and make sure your expenses fit within the rest of the 75 rand, then do that. I mean, as you can see with COVID right now, our industry is the last when it comes to priorities. I mean, we are still not working. We're six months in, and we're it's only now with restaurants opening that some people are starting to gig. That is why it's important that not only are your finances in order, that despite how little you might think you're making, save something. When you start earning in the millions, still sign your own checks. I trust nobody with my finances. Nobody. So before I came and sat here, I literally went to the loo and I sat with myself for just five minutes, just listening to my thoughts and just trying to get into the zone. Remember, I don't like public speaking. So despite the fact that I've been talking for uh, an hour, I'm out of my comfort zone. I am not enjoying doing this, but I understand why I need to do it. I understand why I need to not be afraid to face my fears all the time. 
because that's how you grow. That's how you sharpen your knife. And because my purpose demands that I do things like this, that is why I'm here. But I don't have routines uh, when it comes to my DJ sets. I don't plan my sets either. Normally what I do is I'll ask the promoter, send me the entire lineup so that I know generally where I fit in the bigger scheme of the event. Because based on who's playing before you and after you, and if you know that style of play, you're better positioned to know how to add value to that event. So because I'm versatile, I, I, I can play anything, uh, including gospel. And I know that there's been two guys before me that are gonna play I'm a piano. The guy after me might play hip hop. I need to play something totally different. I feel we don't give paying patrons value for money. Often the DJ arrives five minutes before a set, plays his set and he leaves. Where's the value in that, that you've played five songs that I heard from the previous set? So for me, little things like that uh, go a long way, that give a damn about every single event and find out how you can plug into it, be of value, so that when you leave, you know you've made your mark. The book for me that changed my life, there's a couple actually. There's the, the monk who sold his Ferrari. I read capitalist N-word. <laughs> um, I read The Richest Man in Babylon. In fact, I got The Richest Man in Babylon from uh, DJ Tira. Uh, so shout out uh, DJ Tira. Those are some of the books that I've read that for me uh, uh, made sense. And The Alchemist, The Alchemist. There's no secret to it. Hard work pays off. Knowing your story pays off. Not being full of crap <laughs> pays off. I've got an army behind me because I've avoided burning bridges as much as possible. I've been of value to so many people that I could pick up my phone right now and call them and say, yo, I need a leg up here. And I know for a fact they'll do it because I have built that network of people. Build that network, work that network, but don't think you are too talented not to work hard to keep your job. But having said that though, I think within radio, unfortunately, there'll always only be a handful of people that endear themselves to such a wide and cross-section of people that they could work on any radio station and make it work. So I don't think it's a secret. Not only do I work damn hard, I respect the job that I do. Um, I'm always learning and I know my audience. If you know your audience, you can deliver and cater to your audience. Like how can that go wrong as a formula? A lot of broadcasters broadcast at people. I'm the guy on the radio, I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear versus I know who you are on the other side of the radio and I'd like to share some information with you that might be of uh, mutual benefit to the, to the two of us. So for me, all those little things uh, put together are one of the ways you can stay in this industry for as long as I have. I think, sadly, and I don't know if it's an African thing where we age certain things. We'll say, but you're too old to be doing this or you're too old to be doing that. If it's what feeds your soul, it's your passion, and you can make money from it, ride it until the wheels fall off. Mama Miriam Makeba died after performing. You're never too old to make your passion your career for the rest of your life. So I think we need to stop that, uh, no, now you're too old to be on stage. No, too old for whom? If you have an audience, you have a fan base, service that audience and that fan base. And stop listening to the noise on the side. Not only does our lack of self-esteem become a barrier in getting us, ourselves forward. There's also noise around us that might feed that low self-esteem. So you need to shut out that noise and focus. <laughs> Music has changed. How it makes us feel never will. The time is now to visit mstudios.co.za.